Thank you. White Bordeaux is often forgotten about. Uh, it doesn't really come to mind. And when it does, it often ends up being sort of polarized, that it's either cheap and cheerful, entre de mer, or classic Pesac Lognon. And uh, since I've been working with Bordeaux, I keep saying, and even I would love to get all those books that are written out there that talk about the two styles of white Bordeaux and say, you're wrong. The interesting styles are everything that's in between. In terms of production, yes, it's mainly red wine. But what's really interesting is Cremant. Sparkling Bordeaux now accounts for an entire 1% of all the Bordeaux produced. That's, that's huge. I had been going to Bordeaux many times when I was studying for an MW, but like a lot of people, I went to the Medoc and I went over to saint Emilion, but that was it. Um, so it's been really fun and interesting going into the, the great Wash, the Entre de Mer and the Cote and everything over the last five years. Um, and it's really to, to meet all these uh, young wine growers uh, that don't wear suits and ties, um, that are much less formal. And, and also, the more well-traveled there is, um, I would say there's no longer, but there's less this superiority complex and feeling that we, you know, we are the best. Most of these young wine growers have, have worked in California, they've worked in the Jura, they've worked in New Zealand, and they know that they can learn from other places as well. So there's, a, a, there's more of an openness. Just a breakdown of the white varieties. On the left, it's just all white varieties in Bordeaux, so it's almost half and half Semillon, Sauvignon Blanc, and a little bit of Muscadel, and I wish they would take Sauvignon Gris, and we have a varietal Sauvignon Gris out of other varieties because it's increasingly appreciated. There are 13 different appellations, and I'm sure a lot of people, you know, most wine drinkers have only heard of a few, because when you take Bordeaux Blanc out of it, you take Entre de Mer, uh, you take Grave, and then the little 2% that is Pesac Lognon out, you know, the rest, not many of them come to the market here. And obviously, Cremont de Bordeaux, and Bordeaux Blanc can be made anywhere within the, the Bordeaux vineyard. You know, I think it's really interesting to go back. Up until the frost in 1956, there were more white grapes planted in Bordeaux than red. Back then, you know, the, the great wines were sweet wines, the considered aristocratic wines. And then a lot of white was made, either a very simple wine or a lot was made and sent for distillation. So it really was at the bottom end of the, uh, the food chain. And, and then after the frost, when they needed to replant, uh, a lot of things sort of um, aligned in terms of a realization that there was a better market for, for red wine, that a lot more of the terroirs were actually suited to, to red wine making, and then the whole sort of proportion uh, reversed. So basically then, white Bordeaux really sort of fell out of favor and flavor. Um, and then the next really, iteration came in the 1990s when two people really, the patriarch of the, the Lurton family, André Lurton, who owns among many properties Chateau Bonnet and still lives in Chateau Bonnet, uh, he was a real pioneer and driving force for modern, fresh uh, white Bordeaux. And along with his good friend and uh, the wonderful, sadly the late Professor Denis Dubourdieu at this University of Bordeaux, they did a huge amount of work, and, um, and that was the first things that he basically educated the Bordeaux wine growers, you know, about temperature control, um, not producing oxidized wines, um, and also stainless steel. So to bring sort of Sauvignon Blanc, preserving its aromas and flavors in the vineyard, and also in, in the winery. I don't think I need to educate anyone here about Sauvignon Blanc, and obviously it's made in every which way, mainly, uh, unoaked, but uh, significantly oaked as well, if you think of Pestiglogno. Semillon, a very different variety. We actually have 100% Semillon here as well. It's, it's a wonderful variety. So what Semillon really does, it's not as aromatic, obviously, as Sauvignon Blanc, but it adds that wonderful texture, sort of that waxiness, um, broadens the palate, adds fitness to the, the blend. And obviously, um, being Semillon is also going to add ageability to the, the white wines. And it's a really nice, you know, I think, Again, for people who don't particularly like that brashness of Sauvignon Blanc, it really sort of tames and tempers uh, Sauvignon Blanc and makes for a much more complex wine. Muscadel, you know, it's again, I think the, its demise has often been sort of predicted. But people who love Muscadel really love Muscadel, and there are many growers who have some really old Muscadel vines, and just a little bit in the blend um, really, really can add a nice lift, another dimension, floral notes. And my little friend, the Sauvignon Gris. Uh, again, I used to think of Sauvignon Gris as this workhorse 
that was used to sort of flesh out or you know, bulk out or add volume to the amount of Sauvignon Blanc you produced. But I've come to know and I've come to really kind of like um, Sauvignon Gris. And we actually have a, a varietal Sauvignon Gris from Bordeaux here today as well. You know, it's like dial back Sauvignon Blanc in a lot of its characteristics in terms of particularly the, the aromas. But it does have, it does have a little bit more mouthfeel. And again, that's why it does, can add body to the, the wine as well. But there's something I often recognize, a little sort of spicy kick when you have some Sauvignon Gris in, in the blend. But it certainly adds a little more uh, in terms of volume uh, and texture to the mouthfeel. So let's taste. This is not a blind tasting, unlike this morning. So let's look at the wine. So the first yeah, wine I'm going to taste is from the Entre de Mer. And I always feel I have to stand up for the poor Entre de Mer. It's very beautiful, actually, to spend time there. And um, what's interesting in the Entre de Mer, apart from the fact that obviously it's, it's very large, so it's not just one homogenous blob of basic Bordeaux wines. So as you can see there, the, the limestone, so really is the, is the underbelly of uh, most of the Entre de Mer. And then depending on whether you're in the east or the west, then you have you know, very sort of mixed so soils between some clay, sand, some gravels as well. So our first wine, Entre de Mer, uh, Chateau Sainte Marie, um, but the property is lovely. It's up on uh, one of the highest points in the Entre de Mer. I think we all know Bordeaux is not exactly very hilly. So this is just a very, very classic Entre de Mer style uh, with all the variety, all the, the three main varieties, uh, Sauvignon Blanc, Semillon, Muscadel. And this is 2017, a fantastic vintage for white wine. Actually, in fact, there hasn't been a bad white wine vintage for many years. But 17 has th this gorgeous like tension. I and mean, we'll, we'll taste some 15 and 16, which are richer and rounder. But I love the edginess, that racing set sort of tension that's in 17. I think this wine really, really shows it well. There's great acidity, really juicy, citrusy. Like on the mid to back palate, there, there is some weight. Are you tasting the citrus and sort of loudness of Sauvignon Blanc? But you see you have the Semillon kind of reins it in a little bit. Even that 5% of Muscadel just adds a nice little sort of floral lift. You know, it's not a wine you're going to write a tome about, but I think a very pleasant wine that if you, I don't know. Balance. Sorry? It's a nice balance. It is a nice balance wine. Uh, there's nothing, you know, the acid's not too acidic. It's, there's a nice juicy fruit that's wrapped around that acid. Obviously the alcohol is not, uh, there's no burn or anything there. And, and there's zippy fruit, there's a lot of energy in the wine. So the second wine, we're moving actually to the right bank. And this wonderful property we're going to taste next is in Lusac saint -Emilion. Most of the wine is red, but he actually makes small amount or made a small amount of Sauvignon Gris because he's always loved Sauvignon Gris. He had some old vines and it's, um, it is weightier, isn't it? There's a little bit more viscosity on the palate. It's chirpy, it has some good acid, but it's not as sort of pointed and searing as, as Sauvignon Blanc. Anybody getting a little bit of that spice that I talked about? There's a little bit, or it's not like a, I don't know, a little kick at the back. So this is Charm Godard, and it's the Nicola and his son Cyril who, who run the property and make the wine. And what's interesting here, I mean, this is obviously for, it's fermented in uh, older, or just 15% new, but large oak barrels. So again, it's, it's bringing some texture to the wine. It's not bringing any, any oakiness. There's a very small percentage of, of new. Then when you taste it, the wine really broadens out. It becomes less linear and uh, shapes this way and, and broadens out. And I'm getting that sort of more melony, waxy, um, yellow fruit. The semillon. the semillon coming through, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's a little sort of, um, uh, maybe not so much spice, but balsamic. I'm getting a little bit on the sort of back, you know, the back of my mid palate, my back palate, where I'm tasting the Sauvignon Gris, that little sort of uh, a warm kind of spice and a little bit of, of weight and body. I've worked, tried to work really hard to understand Sauvignon Gris and to try and find it. <laughs> um, and go back maybe to the Sauvignon Gris and taste it and see where where it sits and fits on your palate, and then are you seeing, can you find that then in the, in the blend? The, these wines you know, are not going to age decades and decades, but it's nice to age them a little and just let the boldness of the fruit die down, and, and then you get more of that salinity and, and terroir um, and, I guess, interesting element coming into the wine. So that's uh, wine number three. So now we are 
going to move to, to Grav. And you know, Grav, obviously, you, you know well where Grav is. Um, in terms of the geological formations, it's quite similar to the Medoc in terms of you have these various sort of uh, layers of terraces in terms of, of soil. You have less surface clay in Grav, so as you're from tasting the red wines, the wines tend to be less tannic, they tend to be a little sort of broader, a little more supple than, than the Medoc. The little sort of area of Pestaglonio within Grav is, uh, and is a you know, great so source of the greatest white wines. Um, there's a lot of interesting wine, other white wines being made throughout the, the Grav area. And the next uh, producer that we're going to taste is Christian and Sylvie Oni. And this is a wine that I'm certainly seeing traction among sort of the sommeliers around New York and everything sort of finding this as their little sort of uh, secret sort of grab wine. So have a taste of it. There's a little bit more evident, evidence of oak here. Many wines that are tasted that are 50 Semillon, 50 Sauvignon Blanc. Sometimes they're just fantastically salty and just minerally. Other times you've got that Sauvignon Blanc screaming through. Other times it's about the Semillon, it's about the Sauvignon Blanc. And as I said, other times it's just about that terroir, that almost the variety is just a conduit for the, the terroir. So this is the S de Sudero, and it's 2016. And here you are, 56% Sauvignon Blanc. I think when you're tasting this to me, what I'm getting first is the vintage. I'm getting that warmth and ripeness of 2016. You're here you're south, so you're cooler, you're in the waste southern part of Grave. Um, you also have that kind of more like yellow fruit, uh, like yellow plums, mirabelle, um, yellow kind of stone fruit. Um, there's a warmth. I mean, I don't know exactly what it says in the bottle alcohol-wise, but I would say this is definitely, this is probably 13.5 in terms of alcohol. So you're getting that sort of, that weight from the, and body from the alcohol, uh, the ripeness of the fruit, um, but, but nice sort of citrus zest and, and uh, juiciness. The acid is still holding it. And the semillon, and maybe even a little botrytis, a little honey there. You know, it's not something that they're trying to foster, but given where it is and the, pro you know, the, the vineyards being in the prime area for botrytis. But I think it adds a little sort of, just a nice little honeyed texture to the wine as well. It's kind of like with the orange, a bit of orange marmalade. Um, it's nice, mm. I like this. Yeah. It's, there's a nice juxtaposition of ripeness, and yet they have that spine of acid that's holding it. You have the, the, that nice texture of semillon that is kind of really filling out your mouth, but yet you have that zippiness of, and juiciness of the Sauvignon Blanc coming through as well. Um, and there's a nice sort of otherness to the wine as well. I think a, you can get a sense of terroir. It's not just about the aromas and flavors. There's kind of something else that's lingering on the palate. Because sometimes we're told we're not supposed to talk about minerality doesn't exist. So I have, I have started to call it this something otherness that's there that is beyond the aromas and flavors sort of thing. For the next wine, then, we're going to stay in Sauternes. This is a lovely wine made by Lord de Lambert Campero. Uh, so 100% Semillon. It's vinified in barrel, uh, on lee in, in, in oak. And obviously it's 100% uh, Semillon. And I think when you put your nose into this glass, you can see where you are again. You're in the Southern Grave. You're in, you know, in a riper growing area. So you have that sort of more exotic um, aroma, stone fruits, aromas and flavors, more exotic citrus rather than your lemony lime that you might have got in the Entre du Mer. And just a nice little bit of oak. The oak is not overpowering. Um, and I don't remember offhand the proportion that is new, but it's not a huge amount. So it's, you know, it's there floating, but it's not, um, it's not sort of dominating the wine. The fruit's still coming through. So you've got the waxy semillon, but there's also a kind of something nice and creamy. Do you like this wine? I Should semillon be a varietal wine in Bordeaux? I like it. I, yes. Yeah, good. yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so. Up the Medoc, which is not known for, for whites, but I think as we all know, everybody's making dabbling or making a little. I think it's obvious why this is Van de France, because it's a Chardonnay, Gros Manseigne, Viognier, and a little bit of Sauvignon Blanc. It's not classic, but it's, it's different, it's interesting, and I, um, you know, I hope that all the wines kind of show that there's a lot of interesting things going on with Bordeaux. Maybe they're not all there yet, with all of these experiments, but people are, are trying to 
get out of these sort of polarized perceptions in terms of style. Even despite the oak, you've got those really well-preserved aromas. And that's, you know, it's reductive style, even though it's got new oak, you've got very well-preserved aromas and flavors and precision. So we've come full circle and we're going to end up with a classic. We're finishing then with Pesek and uh, as sort of, you know, obviously there's a lot of, it's a very small area. Uh, 30 years last year, the appellation was created and lots of different permutations, combinations of, of gravels from the Pyrenees and also from the, the Ice Age, from the Massif Central. And uh, the classic, yeah, the, the Penon family, the Carbonneux. And we have 2015, which is, I think, a, a, a lovely example of 15. I'm not always a huge fan of 15, but I think this is a really, really beautiful of, of ripeness and juiciness. Could still open up more. I mean, there's still a little bit of yeah, SO2 coming off the wine. I mean, in the wines, you've got Sauvignon Blanc and you've got some Semillon, so you should be getting something citrus, but depending on the vintage, and also I think down in Pesach, it's slightly warmer. Um, it's south of the city, but also it's got a warmer microclimate. It's protected by the forest as well. So more exotic citrus, so I'm getting more like orange kind of kumquat, and then more riper kind of peachy, but also getting into kind of tropical fruit, some um, papaya kind of guava. Maybe not guava, but maybe papaya, something like that. Um, and there's also that nice little sort of spice from the oak, creaminess. I would love just to kind of hear some thoughts. Can you foresee some of these as our white Bordeaux absolutely. as a member of upcoming Parlement? Oh, or can you see maybe an education event on just white Bordeaux? Uh, you know, I just flew back through these again, which I always love to do after I've learned about them. Mm -hmm. And I like to go back and, and, you know, three, seven, and eight just stood out to me because they had more energy, mm -hmm. more yes. acidity, more brightness, and I really think that and the rest all now taste bubblegummy or cloyey, um, and I think to, to get people convinced to get excited about these, they have to have to kind of focus the three, seven, and eight two, because I think you have to overcome the perception that these are kind of heavy blah, you know, wines. Yeah. They're they're really full of zip. Yeah. And no, I, and, and, I, and I, think I think I think it make that more sensible for food parents. And I I, I think um, to your point, particularly when you mentioned the wine number three, um, it's really important for the future and, and for the credibility that they, the wines have precision, they have length. The Chaum Godard, yeah. to me, is, always has been a very, very interesting wine. And then, obviously, your other two favorites were the Medoc and uh, Pesaglonia. So I think what's coming out is, obviously, the, the top terroirs are shining. But I would say across the board, there's a wine there for many different wine consumers. Today, I'm really liking the Semillant. I, I think it's really, yeah, really. Number that was number six, 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 yeah. So I would say three. I have four favorites. Three, six. Well, I shouldn't say favorites. As I say, I don't like to favor my children. Um, so, but um, in terms of de deliciousness for me, the three, six, seven, and eight.